Hello. And hello. Hello. I'm the Reverend Dr. Greg Dover. And I'm delighted to be here. She is. And I hope you are too, because we want you to participate. Yes, audience participation starts now. We want you to guess which of the following statements applies to which one of us. And we'll let you know by raising our hand. All right, here we go. Okay, that's the easy one because, you know, you're you. But here's the thing. I have a PhD, oh. a Pentecostal hairdo. Oh, looks good too. <laughs> Thanks. In fact, I will be sober seven years coming May. Lord willing, and the crick don't rise. And I only drink bourbon that's been aged at least seven years. That's what we call bougie booze. <laughs> that's me, or should I say, that's me. <laughs> okay. Oh, what'd you do? I lettered in swimming. Oh, football and track for me. Well done. Boop. So what we're saying is that um, we've been in the same place, but not at the same time. Right. So how about we fix that? Let's do it. Well. <laughs> this isn't the joke waiting to happen. I don't know what is. A Baptist pastor and a drag queen walk into a bar. But it was actually a county council meeting. Mm -hmm. Last year, the Greenville County Council met to sunset an anti-LGBT ordinance from 1996. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got to find out about you. Yeah, uh, there were a group of folks who were looking to get rid of that discriminatory mm -hmm. ordinance. and. Uh, I spoke at one of those meetings in support of the LGBTQ community, and there was a video of that. It got shared all the way up to New York City. Yeah, it was the only thing from 2020 that went viral that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But at the next meeting when they were voting, that's when we met. Yep, uh, saw each other and said hello, mm -hmm. introduced ourselves, stayed in touch, and our friendship began. Which is about to come into question right now, because we need to pause for a second. I need to know, as you are the only person who spoke in support of sunsetting this ordinance, mm -hmm. how you, Mr. Cisgender, white, heterosexual, Baptist pastor, mm -hmm. became the voice <laughs> of the LGBTQ community that day? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure myself, and to be honest, I wish it had been somebody from the LGBTQ community community mm -hmm. uh, that was able to speak, but there were only a very few number of spots for speakers. It was first come, first served, and uh, the Bible beaters had made an effort to fill up all of those spots and get mm. there early. Luckily, one of them saw me in my Baptist minister outfit mm -hmm. and heard me mention I was a pastor and called me up, let me cut in front of him and said uh, to the clerk, oh, he's one of us. So I got to talk. I really want to know what he thought of your speech. Yeah, he didn't like it. Uh, I couldn't imagine. He passed me on the way out and he just glared at me and said, you're disgusting. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, hold on just a second. What happened to Delighted? She had a gig. But let's talk about important things. You were just called disgusting mm -hmm. by somebody in your circle. You, your Baptist pastor good old boys club that you got going you know mm -hmm. you have a man who made an assumption about you and then moments later cast judgment as you proved other than his assumption mm -hmm. so how did all that make you feel yeah it was it was shocking really i mean it, it was right. jarring in a way because i don't get that kind of reaction often Couldn't imagine. um and i I recognize that there are people, uh, particularly maybe uh, trans individuals, mm -hmm. um, people who are part of the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. who, who may hear those comments and get those kinds of responses much more often, uh, yes. maybe even on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But for me and then for our church, when we became publicly affirming, uh, we had a number of other Christians, other pastors who thought we were disgusting. 
And it hurts because these are the people that claim the same faith as you. Mm -hmm. And as much as I didn't want to care about what that guy thought, uh, it, I mean, it still hurt. Yeah. I have to say, though, there were a number of others who had a much more positive and encouraging response. As we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get a reaction like that a lot, uh, and I'm sure there are many other people that do. I mean, I, I'm sure you've had some kind of response like that before. What was it like for you? What kind of reactions did you get when you came out or when you first started doing drag? Oh, all my friends thought I was beautiful. <laughs> you are. But upon further inspection of the pictures from that time, I was, looked like the last drag queen on the island, but I digress. <laughs> you know, whether it was coming out of the closet or being a, a drag queen, I have experienced being othered hmm. on, a, on a normal basis. In fact, when I was in first grade, they were teaching rhyming and I was gay clay to the class. And they didn't know what it even meant, but they knew it was derogatory. Yeah. And, and that kind of negativity just sticks with you. I'm sure. Well, what was it like with your family when you came out? I mean, was that a negative experience too or positive? It was challenging. And it's not something I, I want to talk about at the moment. But I will let everybody know that it does get better. So know that. That's good to hear. All right, I gotta, I gotta break in again. Right. I feel like when I asked that question, it got a little awkward. Um, I, I don't know if my curiosity maybe got the best of me, um, but I don't know, it just feels like I overstepped a little bit there. Healthy curiosity is a good thing, but when you're having deep conversations like this, you're gonna have these moments where someone's not quite comfortable being open yeah. about certain things. And it's important to know that if you go into these conversations, you should have boundaries. You mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. what you're willing to, to divulge and what you want to keep private. And you have every right to share that when you feel comfortable. And the fact that you respected me in that moment allowed the conversation to continue. And knowing that this is just the beginning of many conversations is an important thing to know. Yeah, let's that relationship keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's keep going. Let's do it. Got to turn the tables. How does it feel or how was your response when you came out as straight? Um, oh, don't, don't worry, honey. Maybe you just haven't found the right guy. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Mm. Now, on a serious note, you are a pastor and a leader of a community of faith that is notoriously aggressive and discriminatory towards the LGBTQ community. Mm. And despite that, you are an ally. Why? Yeah, I'm sorry uh, for that history. Um, and the Christian church, the Baptist churches have been terrible, um, and that, that is lamentable. But for me, I became an ally because of my experience with one person. Mm -hmm. He was a youth in a church where I was a summer intern for a number of years, faithful, wonderful person, and he called me a few years later and said, I just want to tell you that I'm gay. And I want to tell you that because you're one of the people that has helped me understand and accept and love who God created me to be. And I had no idea what to say or how to respond. I think I said, thank you. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't it, happen it, every day. Yeah. But it did um, start me on this journey to being welcoming and affirming of LGBTQ persons in the church. And because of that, uh, I've gotten to know and love even more delightful people like you. Which I want to ask, where did Delighted to Be Here come from? How did you get started in drag? Oh, I was just immaculately conceived. Just <laughs> appeared out of nowhere. Uh, but it was actually more of a picture at Sicily 1943 or Atlanta 2001 situation. I was the third wheel on a blind date to a camp drag show in Atlanta. 
and we're talking goatees, hairy chest, balloon boobs, body humor, and they were raising money for people living with HIV AIDS. Huh. And it was that juxtaposition of philanthropy and entertainment that, that pulled me in and I fell in love. Hmm. And that was 20 years ago. And though my friend didn't find a husband that day, I found a career. Hmm. And it's just sort of curious to see where that's going to go now that I have moved from New York City down to Greenville. And that's a big move. A little bit. <laughs> What's it like being back in our, in your hometown? I wish I could tell you. I moved during a pandemic, so I haven't really got a chance to explore my favorite little hangouts and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. But what's curious is that there's not an LGBTQ establishment within 100 miles. Hmm. And even while I'm walking around town, I just see these shadows and have these memories of when I was a closeted gay kid who was not welcome, who was not confident in myself. And it was just hard then and, it, and, it, and it's hard now. And I'm really curious as to how that's going to develop as I, as I live here. Um, but I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Yeah, because it's not every day that a Baptist pastor smiles at you and says hello. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we did say hello and connected and have this, this friendship. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, though the friendship will continue, our time can't. So mm -hmm. we must now say goodbye. 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 But not yet. Wait. Not just yet. Yeah. Not a goodbye yet. Now, that was an incredible conversation and I, and I loved having it with mm -hmm. you and it's been an incredible process getting prepared to have this yeah. talk. And a lot of fun. And a lot of fun. But the thing is, this is so critical to give an example of how to have a difficult conversation with folks that you might not think that you seem to have eye to eye with. And it's that saying hello that gets it started. Yeah, and hopefully we have shown how a friendship can result from that, how conversations that are meaningful can come from that initial hello and maybe shown how to have that conversation yeah. and be curious but respectful mm -hmm. uh, and, and finding out more and more about another person. Yeah, and, and it can feel overwhelming mm -hmm. at times. Mm -hmm. it, it, but having those boundaries in place, knowing who you are, getting to know somebody else allows you to open up at your own pace and have that in return yeah. as well. It opens doors. Those, those hellos are an acknowledgement of someone's identity. Mm -hmm. You don't think about that, but just something as looking somebody in the eye and saying hello is an acknowledgement of someone's completeness without assumption or stereotypes being applied. It's an antidote to assumptions. And uh, I think you've said it, that if you ask someone their name, they will tell you their story. It's as simple as that. So that hello is opening a door to the possibilities on the other side, the conversations on the other side, the relationships on the other side, and maybe even the transformation that can happen on the other side. But it all starts with hello. Yes. And unfortunately now is really time when we yeah. need to say actually good, have to, end. to goodbye so how do you normally end your your sermons uh usually with some kind of altar call how mm -hmm. do you end your performances last call mm. yeah but how about we give you a call to action and that is our say hello challenge we would like for you to go out and say hello to somebody start a conversation have healthy respectful curiosity and through those conversations, we can change the world. So as we say goodbye, we want you to say hello. Hello.